Thank you. Hey. It's great to see you. Thanks. We didn't get to see each other backstage before. Hey, how are you? Thank you. We're, we're live, I believe, on, on Facebook Live. We're going to be getting questions, I'm told, as we go. So uh, as they come, I will, I will ask. But I have a couple of my own to okay. begin, uh, which is to say that uh, you have just committed uh, to spend $3 billion, an extraordinary amount of money for anybody. Um, and you're going to be working with Corey. I want to talk about how that relationship uh, began. But tell us for just a second about when you have that kind of money, and you have to make a decision. You don't have to, but how you decided that you were going to spend this amount of money and what you were going to spend it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my career has always been in public service. I was a teacher, and now I'm a primary care doctor. And so I always knew I wanted to work directly with families and children. But when Max was born, I real we realized that the future is now. We need to start building a world in which our children can expect to do amazing, incredible things that we can't even think of now. We needed to start building that future together with this opportunity that we had. So at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we think about what we can do uniquely to advance human potential and promote equal opportunity. And for us, that means bringing resources to the table, but also making sure that we're leveraging our expertise, me as a physician and educator, Mark as an engineer, um, as someone who builds tools and scales them, and really then learning and understanding the context of education, of science, and really thinking about the entire ecosystem and where we can uniquely contribute. And that's when we spend a lot of time thinking about and talking to all the smart people in the field. And in science, when we, we spent about a year doing that, and that work pointed us towards Corey Bargman. Okay, before we get to Corey, just, just take us back a little bit. Yep. Uh, which is so, who do you talk to? When, when you, how does this happen? You say to yourself, we got a lot of money, we did really well, we gotta figure out what to do with it, and you have to decide when you're gonna do something, meaning now or later, right? Yep. There was the Warren Buffett approach to life, which was that he said, I'm a great capital allocator, I'm gonna keep doing that, and at some point later then I'm gonna give the money, in this case, to Bill Gates, and he's gonna do it. But tell us just about some of the conversations you must have had in terms of how you even thought about this. Yeah, there's, I would say, three groups of conversations. One, talking, Mark and I talking to each other. Like, what do we really care about? How do we want to spend our time? And what kind of bets do we want to make? And we decided to start young because we wanted to be able to make long-term bets that would take 25, 50, 100 years to really pan out and be able to learn from those experiences early on. So that, a lot of time with each other. And working with your spouse is not for the faint of heart, um, but it's been really rewarding. Um, the second group of conversation is talking to people who've done similar work. You know, it's who have dedicated their lives to um, making sure they're deploying their resources for social good. So we spend a lot of time talking to mentors in philanthropy. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates are great mentors. Um, Bloomberg. People all across the sector started to learn who are the people that they talk to in building this. And then the part that really is fun for Mark and I is talking to the content area experts, talking to the educators, talking to the scientists, talking to teachers, talking to doctors. And really, like, you know, we know, now we know, well, I studied neuroscience in college, but Mark didn't. And now we're both, we know enough to play scientists on TV, which is our favorite part of the job. Um, but what it actually looks like is talking to one or two scientists and then saying, who else should we talk to? Who else can we learn from? And that looks like a lot of um, trying to meet people in person when we have the chance, and then a lot of video conference of just evenings talking to scientists, which is what you do too, right? Not in the <laughs> same way. Um, and so uh, how did you find Corey? How did you guys find each other? And what a responsibility this must be for you now to try to cure every disease in the world. Uh, we, we found Corey through this process of talking to scientists across the country. And at first, it was really a broad, like, what can we learn? Who can we learn from? And it, st we started then asking that broad group of people, who can help us lead? And everyone started pointing towards Corey Bargman. And that was, one, really exciting for us, that there was in a field where there are so many different groups and sectors, 
everyone really coalesced around Corey, and Corey felt like a great fit from the start because she's, she's a fantastic listener. She's um, really thoughtful and, frankly, um, a great teacher to Mark and I. So tell me what happens. She calls you up and says, I have $3 billion to give you? No, it was <laughs> not quite. But the process is exactly as Priscilla describes it. So Mark and Priscilla are incredibly accomplished, incredibly successful, but they approached science just as something that they were curious about and modest about and wanted to learn more about. And so they called, we had a video conference, we talked about what are the areas of science that could really use new ideas, use new approaches, what would those areas be? We met in person, we kept talking, we resonated really quickly around some of the same ideas. And those are ideas like the importance of collaboration, the importance of being able to bring sophistication in engineering and computational methods to science to make it more powerful, more reliable, and more robust. And just the importance of getting people to work together in fresh new ways and to build tools to make everyone a better scientist. So when you say you're going to cure disease, mm -hmm. that's a big uh, that's a big off. That, 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 that's, a, that's a big target. What's realistic? We think it's realistic. All of them. All, all diseases. <laughs> so, so the, this is the on your goal, shoulders now. The goal is to <laughs> cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of the century. But the first thing to say is that we're not going to do that by ourselves. And that really helps to pose the question clearly because it means that what we have to do is that we have to be catalytic. We have to make everyone a better scientist so that all of science moves faster so that those diseases can be managed. And you know, the end of the century, that's 80 years away, okay? What happened 80 years ago? 80 years ago, the first modern antibiotic was developed, streptomycin. Before that, antibiotics were mercury and arsenic. And you know, they had a chance of killing the bacteria before they killed you, but now, Subsequent to that, antibiotics have been an incredibly powerful method for controlling many diseases. In my lifetime, cardiac medicine has advanced, the statins, blood pressure control, heart transplants, heart valves, heart stents. None of those things existed when I was a little kid. Your friend's father had a heart attack and he just died. And now we have incredibly strong lives that are being led with people who have heart disease. So I think if we look at what's happened and we look at how much progress has been made, I could keep going, right. but then, then you know, looking ahead isn't that bad. And again, it's, it's, now is not the time to slow down. Now is the time to speed up. So how do you prioritize it? I mean, you say to yourself, okay, we're gonna go after all diseases, but I assume you, have to, you, you sort of have to come up with a framework for how you're gonna, gonna do this. Yeah, and we actually, Going back to where we thought we could actually bring added value, we ha took a step back and say, how do we actually not have to choose individual diseases, but how do we actually lift all boats? And that's where Mark's experience is building and scaling tools really came into play, because what we heard from the scientists over the past year is they don't have the same technologies that we all take for granted in ordering a car, talking to someone, you know, getting dinner delivered. They don't have that type of tool, uh, that power of tool and technology to help them solve important problems in science. So when we took a step back, we said we could help with that in addition to bringing people together and really building the movement around science. And that's where the idea of tool building, working with Corey, came into being. So how are you gonna approach this? First thing you're gonna do. So the first thing to do is to decide what the most important unmet needs are and then what the opportunities are to address those needs. And the important thing to say is that I'm not gonna do this, I'm not gonna cure all diseases, and Chan Zuckerberg is not gonna cure all diseases. We're gonna develop the science and technology that make that possible. And we're going to do that by asking people who really know what they're doing, what the best approaches are, what the best people are, and how we can make progress. So we have an amazing science advisory board, and they were all chosen both because they're fabulous scientists or physician scientists, but also because they've been leaders of organizations, different kinds of scientific organizations, and they can teach us how to do that. And it's not just gonna be those seven people either. We want to reach out, 
find people in a field, work with them to identify what they think are the important problems going forward, and then work with them to provide. So what's the, what's the timeline? I know you guys have just gotten started, but in terms of identifying the first batch of projects, mm -hmm. and then how much, when you say, I know the, the three billion dollar number is the public number, but is that the far, part of the first batch? How much is this ultimately gonna cost? Well, uh, the three billion dollars is for the next 10 years, but if we, we have great ideas and great projects, we wanna be able to invest more. And Corey's been thinking through the first batch of how we set up our initial projects, and uh, there's a couple, including Cell Atlas, which you probably wanna talk about, where we are already joining a movement of scientists that are interested in the work. So I should say the first investment of Chan Zuckerberg Science has already started, and that's something called the BioHub, which is a joint research initiative between three great schools in the Bay Area, Stanford University, the University of California, San Francisco, and the University of California, Berkeley. And scientists from all three of those organizations can work within this institute and work together on problems. And I should say, these people have never worked together in the past. The institutional boundary is incredibly strong in science. And it's scientists and it's engineers and we have two launch projects that kind of capture the kinds of things we want to do. One of them is a project on infectious disease to be able to track all infectious diseases so that things like Zika virus and Ebola virus don't jump up on us as some big surprise that we've never seen before. And then to also develop answers to very general questions like why do some vaccines work and some don't? Can we find a way to make all vaccines work that would solve a lot of problems at once? And then the second problem is a tool problem. It's to try to get a parts list of all the different kinds of cells in the human body. It's called the cell atlas. And we're gonna be one of the players in that area, but it's amazing that we don't know that. And it's really clear that that tool, that knowledge of what all the cells are is going to be a foundation to study every disease in the human body. What, what is the analog? Do you think of this as a venture fund of sorts that's investing both in uh, private and public, because of, because that this is set up as an LLC, so you, mm -hmm. you can you can invest in things that hopefully make money too, and or is it mo uh, more along the lines of what Bill and Melinda are doing in terms of their their foundation? Is there is our model for this? We think of ourselves as a foundation, and we want to be able to pr support great ideas, what in education and science for advancing human potential, regardless of where the ideas come from, and what we are excited about in LLC structure is that it gives us enormous flexibility to give great leaders great ideas the support they need. So in the nonprofit world, we do a lot of flexible grant giving. We uh, will be giving engineering support, building tools. Uh, we just hired a CTO, uh, Brian Pinkerton, to help us do that in-house. And we uh, wanna help highlight the stories of people, the great things people are doing in uh, nonprofits. For the uh, for-profit investments, we also want to, if someone's doing a great idea just because it's in a company doesn't mean that there can't be social good coming out of that. And the, we look at the finances, but only because that is a good proxy of whether or not the company's in good health, and if it has a built-in market that can help the idea scale. We're not necessarily interested in returns rather than making sure the company has maximal impact. Uh, along those lines, since we are on Facebook Live, uh, McKay McElroy asks, what is your position on the current debates around philanthropy being more business-like and should philanthropy be more capitalistic? Hmm. We think about making sure, being very careful about what our goals are and what, um, how we measure our work. Because we do believe that we should be held accountable and that when we make investments, we need to know where we are in our progress. I think capitalistic, we're not out to make money. We're out for, uh, to create change in social good. And so it's, um, I think the accountability is key, but not necessarily capitalistic approaches. Right. Um, I want to ask about uh, the NIH, and um, I assume that whatever you do hopefully will get um, uh, mirrored by, by others, including them, uh, but given the election and some of the things that Donald Trump has said uh, about the NIH and perhaps even defunding the NIH, how you think about that 48 hours after this election? Well, 
I think we, like most people here, are relieved that the campaign season is over. And we're trying to figure out you know, where um, the Trump administration is going to be, uh, where their priorities are, and how we can work together. And science has a history of being nonpartisan. And Yeah, I think that, in fact, there hasn't been a lot of talk about science in this election. And I think that's largely because it's not considered a partisan issue, especially not biomedical science. The, doubling of the National Institutes of Health budget, which happened about 10, 15 years ago, was a bipartisan initiative. Everyone gets sick, everyone goes to the doctor and gets told, you know, actually I can't help you because we don't really understand this or what to do about it. And I think there's a great culture of support in this country. The thing about biomedical research though is that it's something that everyone agrees is important, but not necessarily urgent. And so right. you have to bring it to the front of the table to make sure that it becomes urgent, that we make sure to keep it up. We aren't going to replace the NIH. We are going to work with the NIH. We want to partner with a lot of different people and organizations. And we want to build support for the right. great work that they do. When should people, to the extent that people do judge, because they always judge, <laughs> um, judge what you're doing? I think. Um, we always want feedback on how we're doing, and there's just different phases of work. Right now, we're in the team building phase. We've spent the past year recruiting our leaders to make sure that we have a strategy that we can work towards. And the results, it, that, these are long-term problems that come later. I think it, I, we think about iterating and learning fast. I, that In philanthropy, that might be a two-year cycle, but that really, to us, means they should be judging us of, okay, you made this investment, did it work? If yes, great, if no, what did you learn from it? And making sure that we're actually incorporating those lessons ongoing rather than you know, choosing one direction and refusing to iterate and improve. Personal question. Yeah. How do you feel when people criticize you for giving your money away? I ask only because I don't, you, I'm sure you saw the headlines. When, when, you, when you announced you were giving this money away, there were people who said they're not giving enough away or they're not doing enough or, or, or it's a, a, a you know, PR ploy or whatnot. Um, it's, well, it's an interesting problem to be in. And I, frankly, it's a hard thing to do. It's, you, and you know, my grandmother's approach and my grandmother's generation. It's, you're giving your money away. You're giving to charity. It should be easy. But I think the, the way we look at it is like we're trying to be strategic about it. And it's truly very hard and it's a lot of responsibility. So I, I appreciate people keeping us honest and making sure we're on our toes. Um, but it's hard work. Um, I want to open it up to the audience, but uh, Facebook Live is, uh, is asking, Eileen Songer says, oh, what will we be doing to revolutionize the antiquated state of education in the U.S.? Is that, I know that's another pillar of, of what you're working on. Yeah. So we, we this year, we ha talking of team building, we hired Jim Shelton, uh, former, former Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Education. And we're working on personalized learning. How can we actually help kids learn 100 times more than they can today? And that is, um, that's a big goal, and I think the first part comes from really storytelling of what great teachers and great schools are doing that's different than what you and I experienced. Uh, because after we finish school, we don't really have a window into what it's like. And so we need to start sharing the stories of what's possible, what is the great right. work, so that everyone can understand and start asking for that for their children. Okay, let's open it up. I know there's so many people with questions. Uh, go ahead. I love your idea and your big thoughts. And when you said the topic is important but not urgent, it made me realize you need, in some ways, you need to personalize it. This is what politicians have done beautifully. Nobody cares if 20,000 people are killed, but if they talk about Johnny or Susie, all of a sudden people get very passionate about the idea. So my question to you is when you're dealing with the cell atlas, is this very similar to like Matt Ridley's genome book where he personalizes all 23 chromosomes and makes it real and, and makes people say, hmm, some of these things are predictive, some of them aren't? Because I think that would be a really uh, interesting guide as you try and personalize this and make it urgent. So I don't know if you ever saw or heard of a movie called The 
fantastic voyage from the 1960s where they shrunk a bunch of people in a little submarine and then sent it down through the blood vessels of the body. And um, I think, you know, the cells of the body kind of are like amazing creatures, each doing a different thing and carrying out a different task. And maybe you could make them a little more like, like personally accessible. But I think also, you know, the cells in your body are part of you. It's, it's a personal thing right there. The reason that you don't get massive headaches and a sugar buzz after every meal is because you have cells that are taking care of, of that, that issue and putting insulin to, into your bloodstream. I think it's fascinating. And the personal connection often comes through disease, knowing you know, when you have diabetes, wait a minute, what's happened here? What, why did this happen? Who's not playing on the team anymore? And I think that there's, people want to learn about these things. Looking at medical information is one of the widest uses of the internet anywhere, and I think it becomes very personal when you're affected, your family is affected. So I'm optimistic that we can make it seem both important and urgent. So a hand go up right here in the middle. Can you get him a microphone, sir? Thanks. One thing that wasn't mentioned in the whole discussion were any interaction with uh, major pharmaceutical companies. What role will pharmaceutical companies yes. have in all of this with you? It's a terrific, amazing resource that have developed all these wonder products we enjoy. We have uh, a, one of our, the members of the advisory board of the Biohub is a high level executive in Novartis, uh, a pharmaceutical company. There are different roles that people play in developing medicine. If you're sick today, you should not come to me. I'm a scientist. And you should not go to a pharmaceutical company. You should go to a doctor. And these are different stages along the development of diseases where if you go to pharmaceutical companies, they will say, we want more science. We can't make better drugs for Alzheimer's because we don't know enough about the brain. So they are our partners too. No one has a monopoly on the best approach. Everyone has a part to play to move these things forward. Are there any diseases you think that we're the closest on, on beating right now? I mean, do people say, I, I assume, by the way, since you announced this, everybody and their brother must have come to you and say, we are on the verge of curing this if you help us. That's, we, a lot of people have reached out, but I think there's different type levels of maturity. and. Uh, cancer, for instance, we're starting to really understand more and more and be able to target individual cancers and understand how they work and be able to respond in a way that's individualized to a particular patient. So I think there's a lot of work there, but I know, Corey, you've spent a lot of time thinking about that, this, and as well as neuroscience. Yeah, I think that there are areas where we're really close to curing diseases. My an example from that's sort of all developed during my life lifetime is HIV AIDS, which first appeared, um, was first recognized in this country in the early 1980s, and at that point it was a death sentence. After diagnosis, you had maybe six months or a year. And now, if you're diagnosed with HIV AIDS, your life expectancy is another 50 years. It's an incredible advance, and people are working very actively now on vaccines that I think within the next few years have a chance of being a true prevention right. for, for something so that the whole life cycle of the disease right. could have happened within a single human life. How much of this is inspired by being a pediatrician by day? I think a lot of it, and uh, like I we said. We haven't really talked about that, well, your, your day job. Yeah, I, I am a pediatrician, I'm a primary care doctor, and I run a school, uh, and I, that, Working on the front lines is incredibly important to me because I work with children and families and I, as a provider, feel the systematic barriers that families face when they're trying to access services. And that actually is incredibly influential in the direction we point our work because I get a front row seat to seeing what works and what doesn't. And um, it's incredibly rewarding for me and then our work at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is a way to actually help remove those barriers for you know, patients in the future. Right. Let's sneak in one final question, if we could. I know there was a hand over here. 
Um, yes, I may be the only other pediatrician in the room. I'm at Johns Hopkins. I'm uh, really very excited about what you're doing. It's just remarkable. But you started out with the example of the miracle of uh, antibiotics and uh, what that's done. But when you think about it, uh, we have those antibiotics now, and Dr. Chad will know that uh, the, the whole clinical process of decision making about when to use it properly, uh, sharing those decisions, and issues of adherence, especially in those individuals with the social determinants of health. Um, are, are you going to be addressing that, or you know, we could have the more miracle things that, that uh, with a broken clinical process? Yeah. That's a great question, and antibiotics is an interesting example because it bridges both basic science of making sure that we have new and better antibiotics and public health and uh, clinical medicine. And we are focused on, from the basic science research, we want there to be more pathways to be, have access to better medications. And then the clinical medicine and public health side, we, we see ourselves um, is probably a, a version two or three of, of, of our involvement um, after we make sure that we've set up a good foundation for Corey on the basic science side. And then on the social determinants of health and the adverse childhood experiences, um, and those for the audience who aren't familiar, it's it, the realization in medicine that as a child, if you have really tr terrible things happen to you as a child, it impacts the way your body works and your health and your future potential going forward. And that's a lot of the work that we're doing in education, actually. We see personalized learning as part, uh, in sort of the whole child approach really overlapping. And that when we say we want to personalize what a kid needs to learn, we both mean like, oh, do you prefer reading or videos? And what do you need in your home life in order to really succeed? What do you need from your doctor? And that's. We do grant making in that area, and um, the primary school, which I run, um, is founded on that principle. Final question uh, from Facebook. Not totally on topic, but definitely topic of the day, um, and maybe it's a better question from Mark, but uh, Beth Jackson asks, do you think that Trump will censor Facebook? <laughs> you know, I, it's... Right now, we are all waiting anxiously to see what Trump will do, what the president-elect will do in the coming years, and we're anxiously awaiting to see um, how we can work together. Okay, fair enough. Uh, thank you both, and thank you both for what you're doing, and we really appreciate uh, all the time that you gave us. Thank you.